you'll take your Bibles this morning, turn to Luke chapter 2. This is part 2 of what the shepherds witnessed. What the shepherds witnessed. Now there's a whole lot more here uh, this morning than what we're going to be able to get to. But since uh, December 21st has come and gone, we'll just continue on. Amen? Did, did anybody here really believe we were going to, it was the end of the world? Did anybody really believe that? No. Somebody up raising their hand up there in the crow's nest said, yeah, no. We didn't. You know why we didn't believe that? Because we have the word of God. Amen? God has made it clear. No man knows the day nor the hour. Besides, chronologically, there's a whole lot more of living and a whole lot more of Christ's revelation that has to take place before the end of the world. Amen? He still has to take us in the rapture. We still have to go. The world still has to go through that tri- uh, seven-year tribulation period. We still have to witness the second coming of Christ and the, all the angels and saints come with him. He still has to set up his millennial kingdom in Jerusalem and rule and reign on this earth for a thousand years. There's still a whole lot more before the world ends, amen, at least this world. Now, uh, we left off last week with verses 13 and 14, if you were here. If not, oh well. (laughs) An outline this morning's message should be in the back of your bulletin. Oh yes, I also wanted to say that Kenny Jackson and his family are here. So, you know, welcome. I'm sure it's quite familiar for you in a lot of ways. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Thank you. Well, stand up. You introduce your wife to us, those of us who don't know. Stand up. We'll see how good-looking both of you are. How's that? Okay. Amen. Amen. Good to see you. It is. Awesome. I bet you're happy. Ah. I'll see you. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And then Daniel, Daniel, where are you? Stand up. The new baby's here. Stand up. Angelica. And what was his name again? Oh, Daniel, of course. <laughs> Sorry about that. They moved to San Diego. We haven't seen them for a couple of months, but if you remember, they came, they got married here, and then left us. She left with a round belly and came back with the baby, Daniel. Wonderful, huh? And Karina, good to see little Karina, too. We call her second Karina. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, let's get into the Word of God this morning as we focus on the meaning of Christmas and what the shepherds witness Let's start in verse 13 and 14 this morning. And suddenly there was with the angels a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill to men. And this is point one in our outline this morning entitled A Song. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this awesome day. It is like any other Sunday, Lord, because we uh, congregate together Uh, as one unit, as a body of believers who are knitted together in Christ. But it is unique because this is uh, Christmas, the time we celebrate our our Christmas celebration to you as our God, our Lord, our Savior. Lord, we just ask that as we look at the scriptures that are so familiar with us, that we would catch a glimpse, fresh and anew, of what Christmas is all about what it's all about, Lord. We know that we have been downplaying uh, Jesus' competitor, and we want to do that. We want to exalt Jesus Christ today. And so, as the Son of God, we do that today by exalting you through the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. From last week, if the appearance of that single angel wasn't enough to petrify the shepherds, A multitude of angels would, and we see that here now. This appearance was to give testimony to the validity of the angel's proclamation. The angel came and gave the proclamation. Then the the host of angels, as we see there. It's not unlike the Father's proclamation at Jesus' baptism, if you remember, where he said, 
This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And so the multitude of angels in the same manner gave glory to the Father because of his Son. Because of his Son. And this is nothing more glorious. There's nothing more glorious in heaven and on earth than the story of Christmas and the Father giving the Son to mankind. Amen? A sinful um, world, God giving the Son. Nothing more glorious than that. Amen? All of heaven can't contain the praise for such a glorious event, and so we see it here in verses 13 and 14. Do you see it? They break out in praise in verse 14. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill to men. Basically, they're saying all the glory goes to God. All the glory goes to God. Man takes no credit for God's salvation. Amen? Amen. What happens if you say amen? If we get out of here faster, Amen? God gets all the glory for it. It's his plan, and he makes it happen. He makes it happen. I like to say amen to those kind of things. It's kind of like a crescendo, you know what I mean? Amen, glory to God, praise the Lord. You know, that word glory here means that which attracts honor. That which attracts honor. All the glory goes to God. Yes, the birth of the Son, yes, it is God's plan. He made it, he designed it, he makes it happen, but all the glory goes to God. That's what it means. A couple of weeks ago at uh, the market days, um, my uncle Richard, Richard Sanchez, he, they, had, they had the old cars out there that they have almost every market days, you know, the really cool old muscle cars and hot rods and all the cars. But he had this little, this real cool little motorcycle from, I don't know, it must have been 40, 50, 60 years old, this neat little restored old motorcycle. And everybody was standing around and they were kind of gawking at this and admiring that and saying, oh, how cool, how awesome. But the person who was really getting the glory wasn't the motorcycle. It was my uncle because it was his motorcycle. He paid the price. He had somebody do the work. On and on it goes. He was receiving the glory for the, I don't know, the coolness, I guess, of that motorcycle. And that's what this word glory means. It means that which attracts honor. The Lord is attracting the honor. God is attracting the honor for this awesome thing. And just to make sure that the shepherds don't miss that point, as far as who's getting the glory, notice what it says there. They added in the highest. Glory to God. All the glory goes to God who is in the highest. In the highest. This is to give the shepherds kind of an angelic perspective, if you will, so they could see what the angels knew about God and where he dwelt. We all know that God dwells somewhere in heaven, but we just don't know where heaven is. We don't. Can't get there in a rocket ship, right? A rocket ship won't go that far. Can't get there in a putt-putt car either, right? As the old saying goes, So the shepherds are at the lowest part, and God the highest. So glory is rightfully due to him. Amen? Not only in status among men as shepherds are they the lowest, but in location, in relation to heaven, God is the highest. He sits at the the highest. God dwells at the most highest point in the universe, and that is heaven. And there's none who sits higher than God. He is exalted highly on the throne, highest in heaven wherever that is. Um, It's actually where Satan wanted to dwell, where Satan wanted to sit. In fact, he said that he was going to ascend higher than God sat. He would be the highest, higher than God. In fact, he wanted to be much higher, which resulted in his ultimate and complete fall. So Satan was cast down to the lowest parts, and as high as God is, Satan is as low, as low. Now the Bible speaks of three levels of heaven. Does anybody know what they are? Let me give them to you. One, the first level of heaven, the blue sky or the atmosphere. You can see it when you step outside the door. You look up, that's the first level of heaven, the blue sky, which we see so much of here in the Imperial Valley. Amen? That's why we live here in the Imperial Valley, because of the beautiful blue skies and the wonderful heat. The second is outer space, right? The cosmos, you can see that at night when you look out at night on a nice, nice, clear summer evening. Amen? Or even right now if you go out at nighttime. It's so beautiful, isn't it? The cosmos, the second heaven. And then the third where God dwells. This is the highest point that the angels spoke of. Now thirdly, notice verse 14. The angels bring the focus down to earth now. They first they 
They, they cast the glory above, up to God, the one in the highest who sits in the highest, the highest place of all the universe, of all that is created, all that is seen and unseen. And now they bring the focus down to earth where the Lord has started his work of redemption by sending his son. Do you guys mind if I take off my coat? I feel a little bit uh, hot. No, not hot. Just a little bit. Yeah, there you go. Thanks. Thank you, wife. Notice what it says, saying, and, and on earth peace and goodwill to men. Peace and goodwill to men. So because Christ has come, a man can now have peace with God. A man can now have peace with God because Christ has come. That is their proclamation. And as a result of peace with God comes the peace of God. Two things, peace with God and the peace of God. That's why sometimes at Christmas time, you'll see the word on somebody's roof, peace. Or you'll see it somewhere else displayed, the word peace. That's what this is all about. This is Christ who has come, and now man can have peace with God. And because of that, he can, he can have the peace of God. And you can't have the latter without the former. So God declared war on mankind when Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, when they sinned against the Word of God. God declared war on man, but Christ's coming, his substitutionary death on the cross as a payment for our transgressions has brought reconciliation, reconciliation between man and God. Or let me say God and man. That's better. But I wanted you to turn to Romans chapter 5 for just a minute. Can you do that? Romans chapter 5. This is really an exciting passage of Scripture. I know I say that about just, just about every Scripture that I turn to, you know, but it is to me, especially in context, and in the context of the sermon today, notice verses 8 through 11, that God has brought reconciliation between men and God, or God and men, and that is in verse 8. But God demonstrated his own love towards us. See, love is a demonstration, especially on the part of God himself. He demonstrated his love. He didn't just say, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you. He showed it. He proved it. He demonstrated it. He acted it out. So he shows his own love towards us that while we were still sinners, aren't you glad about that truth? Still sinners. I'm still a sinner today. Amen? Is that amen for you or amen for me? Okay. That we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than, Paul builds up, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies... There's that whole idea of war and peace, okay? For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life that he gave, of course. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Yeah, amen. That's a good one there. You missed that part. You missed that opportunity. Look at verse 1 of the same chapter. So God and man can now be at peace. And Paul says this in verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, what's he say? We have what? Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that, it's always that, always through our Lord Jesus Christ. Anything that we have, any kind of right standing that we have before God, we didn't get it on our own. It came through Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And peace with God translates into the peace of God. How? By simply knowing that we are no longer at war with Him. We have the peace of God by simply knowing that we are at peace with God. We are no longer at war with Him. We are no longer His enemy, as verse 10 said there in chapter 5. God is no longer our enemy, and we are no longer His enemy. And knowing that gives us peace. You know, it's kind of like, like owing a large sum of money to the biggest, toughest, strongest, meanest guy in school. You borrowed some money for lunch, and you owe it to him, and you don't have it. And he's after you, right? He's after you. That would make a fearful thing, would. When I was a boy in elementary school, the meanest, toughest, strongest guy was quite mean and tough and strong and big. I was never a big guy to begin with. I wasn't tall like Kenny and the other guys, you know. Uh, but I was fast. Someone comes along then in my fear and, and uh, trembling. Somebody comes along and pays that price for me. 
Somebody comes, up, comes, out, comes along and finds out that I'm in debt to this guy and he's after me. His, his anger and his wrath is after me. He's going to get me. He's going to get me. So I'm afraid for that. In fact, he says, I'm going to meet you after school. And he waits out at the front of the school and I go out the back. Right? I'm avoiding this confrontation with this guy. But someone hears about it, someone who, who cares about me, hears about it, and he pays that debt for me. And so the guy's no longer after me. He's no longer after me. Why? Because all he was concerned about was getting his payment, right? That's all he was concerned about was getting that payment, and someone paid it for me, so why should he be after me? He's not. And that would give me a huge sense of relief. It would give me peace, right? The fear goes away. He's no longer after me. But it goes farther than that because once the debt is paid, he makes me a part of his gang. Isn't that cool? Makes me part of his group, part of his homies. In the case of God then, he makes you part of his family, specifically one of his children. I love that part about the gospel truth. He makes us one of his children because Jesus has come and has paid the penalty for my sin and for your sin in your place. He dies in your place. He takes the punishment of death, your punishment for death, upon himself. That, that to me is, is, gives me peace. It gives me peace. And this is the peace that the angels refer to. The reason there's such a lack of peace in the world, well, it's because too many are still at war with God in the world. That's why there's such a lack of peace in the world today. There's just too many... To a large majority in America now, it, it probably equals to over 50% now, maybe more. There's more people in America who aren't at peace with God but at war with God. That's a terrible situation for our country. At one time, whose founders and those who followed in their footsteps were at peace with God. And of course, we see the, the uh, ramifications of that beginning to build even in our own personal lives now, don't we? The world hasn't made peace with God through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and our country is moving away from that truth. Now, before we move on to our second point, I have to make something clear here in verse 14. Something I have to make very clear in verse 14. I just have to do that. I'm compelled to do it. I'm compelled to do it. You know what it's like to be compelled to do something, right? Last few days, my wife's been compelled to go shopping. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Probably her sister and my sister's and everyone else's wife, right? Notice the phrase there in verse 14, goodwill towards men. Sad to say, the translation that I, that I choose to use and read from, from the pulpit um, hasn't, ha, can do a better job at translating this verse. Could have done a better job at translating this verse. The NASB and the ESV and the NIV have done a better job translating the verse. And so I'm compelled to make it right. Compelled to, to let you know that it makes a lot of sense, but it doesn't make sense in the King James. Both the King James versions give you, give you the idea that, that Christ's coming, that him coming to the earth, kind of brought a universal peace and goodwill towards men around the world. That's what it kind of gives you, and that's kind of like, in fact, the song, one of the songs we sang implied that. It implied that. You know, his coming, his coming kind, of, kind of brought peace and and goodwill to the earth. That's the implication in this verse. That was the implication in one of the hymns that we sang a few moments ago. That is the implication. I often wondered why it's not so. If that's the implication, how come it's not so? How come there's no peace and goodwill in the world if Christ's coming brought that? As it is inferred there in that passage of Scripture. Right? Why don't we see that? There's so much war and there's so much ill will I'll give you a case in point, all those children that were murdered just recently. Wasn't that a sad thing? In our country, of all places, in our country. And that was not the first time. That's like the fifth time in the last four years or the fourth time in the last four years or five years. What a travesty to say I stand behind this flag and I stand behind this country and I live in this world where people in, this, in our own country do terrible things. You know, if you want to shoot up adults, shoot them up. If you want to shoot up soldiers, do so. That's what we're called to do. But children, I don't see any peace. I don't see any goodwill. Do you? 
I don't. So it must mean something different, right? It must be. And the answer is found in a better translation. I'm going to give you, I want to give you two at each end of the spectrum, okay? New American Standard Bible says, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Now that's distinctive, right? That's distinctive. And the New American, or the, the New International Version says, and I know you guys are going to rake me over the coals for this, and you're never going to let me live it down, but I think the NIV got it acts, acts exactly right here in this particular place. I think they got it exactly right. Glory to God in the highest of heaven and on earth. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. Oh, by the way, the ESV confirms the same truth, but, but that promise of peace brought by Jesus coming is conditional it is a conditional promise conditional right it's not a universal peace that covers and coddles the earth as it being implied in the new king james or the king james and in one of those hymns that we just sung it is not that it is not a universal peace that covers and coddles the earth it makes everything feel wonderful and hunky dory and utopian like where everybody just kind of loves each other and we all just kind of get along. Right? It's not that. That comes later during the millennial kingdom. This is a conditional peace among those whom his favor rests. This means something very different. It means that only certain people have this peace that Christ brought. Right? It speaks of those who have received his offer of salvation or Christ's redemptive work redemptive work on the cross, those who have his favor upon them. And without going into great detail, the correct translation is actually speaking of God's divine election. And that's what I'm compelled to talk about this morning. God's divine election. It's such a wonderful doctrine, such a wonderful truth that the scripture reveals over and over again from Genesis to Revelation that too many people seem to avoid, and I'm not sure why. I was, my pastor avoided it, and I don't know why. It wasn't until I became a pastor and I started studying the Word of God completely and totally in my, of myself when I began to discover the truth that God had about his divine election. But it's God's favor. God's favor only rests on those whom he has favored. That's what it says. By granting them or appointing them to salvation. And there's no greater peace to have than to know that you have been favored by God. Amen? To know that you have been chosen by God. To know that you've been favored by God. That is an incredible peace-giving truth. To know that God has looked down and favored me gives me peace. Because I don't deserve it. I never deserved it and I still don't deserve it. I'm always captivated by the thought that God has favored me. Especially when I don't deserve it. Such a sinner as I am. And this favoring by God can be best illustrated when the angel came and told Mary that she, among all women, had been chosen or favored by God to give birth to the Son. God's choice of, of Mary was, a, was an expression or an illustration. It was a, a, an illustration of his favor towards her of all women. Let's go to chapter 1. Are you in Luke chapter 2? Go to Luke chapter 1. And we'll take a look at that. Luke chapter 1, verse 28. It is an awesome revelation. What God is really revealing to mankind and what he is, he is specifically revealing to his chosen, to the elect. Look what he says about Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, what? Highly what? Favored one. So many people want to exalt Mary because they think that there was something special about Mary. There wasn't anything, any, anything uncommon about Mary. There wasn't anything special about Mary except that she was favored by God. That's what exalted her to her position. That God had chosen her from all the women. She wasn't the only virgin in town. She was probably one of many. One of many. And why God chose Mary and not the others, I don't know. Only God knows that, right? But she was highly favored by God because he chose her. She had no idea it was even coming. No idea. 
And sometimes that's how salvation comes. A lot of times that's how it comes. It just comes because God chose it to be. And it comes and surprise! Right? There it is. Favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Why was she blessed among women? Because God had chosen her, favored her. What we don't know is how God comes about his choice because all have sinned and none are deserving. None. Well, I want you to go to Ephesians real fast. We're going to wrap it up here in about another hour. Amen? (laughs) Ephesians chapter 1. I want to show you something really cool about what I'm talking about here, this favored, this idea of being favored by God, chosen by God. Ephesians chapter 1 is the only place in the Bible, specifically verse 6, that gives us a rendering of the word favored here in Luke chapter 1, verse 28. But we, for emphasis, okay, for emphasis, we need to read verses 3 through 7 so you can really catch the whole picture of it, so you can see it in context. So let's read verse 3 of Ephesians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Just as he chose us in him, when? Before the foundations of the world. You see, God's divine election for us occurred before God ever created the world. That's what foreknowledge is. Foreknowledge is, is God knew you. He didn't look down the corridor of time and look because God doesn't need to do that. God knew you intimately because he chose you before the foundations of the world. He, he uh, um, planned to create you and he planned to save you before he ever said, let there be light. That's foreknowledge. That's foreknowledge. That he knew you intimately in times past, in eternities past, right? Just as he chose you in him before the foundations of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. See, that all occurred, that all occurred in times past. Look what he says in verse 5. This has to do with the future. Having predestined us to adoptions as sons by Jesus Christ himself. See, it's always through Jesus Christ or by Jesus Christ. According to the, what? Good pleasure of whose will? His will. His will. This is the part that speaks of his favoring, resting on us, which brings peace. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us, what? Accepted. That's that word favored there that is used about Mary. Accepted. God made her acceptable. God makes us acceptable. And how does he do it? (coughs) Through Christ. Through Christ. Without Christ and without his shed blood, we would not be even, I'm going to use a really bad English word, we would not even be lookable. Okay? Sorry about that, English teachers. He wouldn't even cast his gaze upon us. Even in choosing us and before the foundations of the world, he didn't do that apart from his first choosing his son to come and cover us with his blood. He wouldn't even think of looking at us, any of us, apart from the finished work on Calvary. Amen? Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood. See, there it is, the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. So, peace with God is conditional upon those he favors or those his favor rests. That's where the peace comes from. So you've got a whole lot of people who walk around with peace, peace with God and the peace of God, and a whole lot, multitudes of people who don't have it because it's personal and it's conditional upon God's favor resting on those, right? And those whose his favor rests are, are the called They're the chosen, they're the elect, and you see it over and over again in the Scriptures. Over and over again in the Scriptures. Those whom have have received his offer of salvation, who by the convicting truth of God's Word and the drawing work of the Holy Spirit come to saving faith in God the Father through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that can happen to anyone. It can happen to anyone. We don't know who they are. Only God knows. It can happen to anyone. Charles Spurgeon said that if, he, if God would have wrote a, an E on the back of all the elect and he would just go and tell the elect the truth, open up, lift up the back of their shirt to see who they were, but we don't know. Only God knows. Only God knows. It could be you or you or you or you. We don't know because it's, it's his choice. Amen? 
So this was the truth that the multitude of angels sang about, proclaimed. This was it. This was that awesome truth that this is now happening, that God had determined it before, it before the foundations of the world in eternity has passed, and now it was coming into real time. In real time. It's happening. It has happened. It's happening. It's going to continue to happen on into eternity. And they were rejoicing over that. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Amen? Amen. It hasn't been an hour yet, has it? We'll get to point two next week. And point three and point four. Let's bow our heads. I hate to cut it short like this. But since the end of the world has come and gone, there's always next week. Amen. God willing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth. There's so much theology, Lord, packed in the Christmas verses, in the Christmas story. So much more folded within those verses than what the average person ever sees, Lord. But it is, it is your mandate that we, we, we dig on below the surface and between the lines and see what's really happening in that passage. And there's just really not enough time to do it all justice. But it's so very important that we catch a glimpse of the greatness of Christmas. And that is this favoring work that you have given this goodwill, your goodwill, your plan of redemption of mankind, specifically the chosen, the elect. What a privileged knowledge to know that it, it wasn't something that I stumbled upon, but something that you definitely intended to save me before I was even a thought, before Adam and Eve ever sinned, you chose to create me and to save me for your glory. As the scripture says, someday as we are fully glorified, we will shine like the brightness of the sun, those on whom your favor rests. Help us to rejoice tomorrow and the next day. Let's Remind us, Spirit, Holy Spirit, remind us as you dwell inside of us. Remind us as we are getting caught up with the food and the fun and the family and the gifts and all the wonderful words and all the reality of family and friendship. Remind us that we have peace. Peace with you and your peace. Because you've made it possible. You've favored us, God. That is an awesome message for Christmas. And I am a chosen. I am a favored one. I'm the blessed one. Because you've sent Christ to die for me. Maybe there's someone here today with your heads bowed and eyes closed. God is tugging on your heart this morning. Maybe it's the first time you've ever heard the gospel. Maybe it's the first time you've heard it put this way. I don't know. But you're here by divine appointment. God has brought you here for a particular reason. That is to hear him, to hear how much he loves you. He's chosen you. He's brought you here by grace, by his merciful grace. And you're here today and you say, Pastor Albert, would you pray for me? I want to know this, God. I want to know it. I want to be favored. You just raise your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you, anybody at all. Just slip your hand up. God is speaking to you. He's speaking to your heart wants to bring you into the fold. You owe him a great debt, a debt of sin that you can't pay. He's at war with you and you with him, but somebody's paid the price for you, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and now you can have peace with God. Anybody at all before we go? I'm just looking around, not going to embarrass anyone. What a great Christmas that would be. Anybody at all? Anyone? Amen. I see your hand, sir. Anyone else? It's okay if you're afraid to, to raise your hand. I understand that fear. I do. But you pray a simple prayer in your heart like this. God, forgive me. I'm a sinner. 
I know. But thank you for revealing the truth to me today. That I could be a child of the king. I could be forgiven for my sin. I could be right with you, have peace. Peace with you, the peace that you have. And I ask through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the power of his shed, shed blood, to forgive me of my sin and establish a new life in, my, in me and a place in heaven when I die. And if you prayed that and you meant that, as God was tugging on your heart, he promised to answer that prayer. And today you are a new creation in Christ. Thank you for those who raised their hand, Lord. Thank you for us that are confirmed in your word today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.